morning, everyone. Uh, this is very unfortunate because this presentation was actually intended to build on top of the Fiji presentation. So um, I will begin and I will give you an overview of what is taking place in the Caribbean. I'll give you an overview of what is taking place in the Caribbean as it relates to internet governance and development. I should start off by, by saying that the Caribbean, while it is a term that is commonly used, is in fact a very diverse region. Uh, in the Caribbean, you find um, nation states that are uh, former colonies of Britain, English-speaking states, uh, former colonies of Spain, Spanish-speaking countries, uh, France, and the Netherlands. And they all form part of what is known as the Caribbean. Uh, you also find a very wide range of economies from Haiti, uh, which has uh, one of the lowest uh, GDP per capita in the world, to Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands, and others that are, are quite um, prosperous countries. So when we say the Caribbean, understand that we're talking about a region that is not homogenous. We're so talking about a region that is rich in both its history, its culture, languages, and, um, and economies. Its history, its culture, now, languages, some of the characteristics and, um, of the, the Caribbean are very similar to what you'd find in other um, developing regions. Uh, and that is from an, uh, and I'll give you an overview from an infrastructure standpoint, from an, an e economic standpoint. Uh, you do have countries that are still very much in the early stages of economic development. And of course, by implication, that means infrastructure is still largely a work in progress. Um, societal structures in terms of laws, in terms of um, institutions are also not as developed as you would find in more advanced economies. Now, this presents some interesting um, scenarios for, for the Caribbean as far as, as internet governance is concerned. But I want to make this point. While these states face peculiar challenges because of their geography, because of their economy, because of the small population sizes, they also hold tremendous opportunities, uh, opportunities that allow the region, the Caribbean region, and I, I think this also applies to the Pacific Island states, opportunities to demonstrate the, the true transformative power of the Internet at a national level. These are very small countries. Um, in some cases, for example, Montserrat, one of the island states in the Caribbean, has only 5,000, a population of 5,000. Now, you can do a lot with 5,000. There are a lot of constraints and challenges as it relates to having a population that small, but in terms of talking about Internet governance issues, in terms of um, setting infrastructure and policies in place and having immediate national level impact it's very possible and that is what I, I want us to, um, to focus on as we look at the the Caribbean region I, I want to give you an example based on one of the hats I wear in the region I serve as a program director for an initiative known as the Caribbean ICT Roadshow or the Caribbean Information and Communication and Technology Roadshow uh, this is something that we began three years ago with the specific objective of reaching out to governments, to private sector, and to civil society, and to bring them into a greater awareness of some of the emerging internet governance issues. Uh, inside of that process, there are a number of, of, of examples that I want to reference that will allow us to, to get a sense of how internet governance is evolving in the Caribbean. I should also point out that the Caribbean held its first internet governance forum eight years ago. Uh, this is the seventh international internet governance forum. The Caribbean actually first gathered the stakeholders uh, eight years ago to start looking at some of these issues about how the, the region had to, to deal with, address and grapple with the growth and increasing impact of technology in small states. Uh, some things that we have had to overcome and that we are still dealing with, I want to, to cover. One, the ignorance factor, dealing with the, what, what, what can be summed up as an insufficient appreciation of fundamental principles and tenets that govern the Internet. Uh, you do have uh, societies that are largely consumers of Internet content and consumers of technology generally. And as we push the, the Internet governance issues, one of the big things that, that uh, we have had to deal with is creating that paradigm shift that allows people to, to understand that you don't only have to consume or take 
um, what is coming at you, you can play a part in defining and shaping how the internet evolves. And this is where the whole bottom-up stakeholder, multi-stakeholder approach uh, has a very real impact on the Caribbean's participation in IG issues. But another element inside of overcoming the ignorance is dealing with the reality that there is limited coverage and more importantly, limited relevant analysis of critical internet governance issues. Uh, the media, by and large, as, as one constituent, uh, does not have a, 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 an a history or an inclination to cover what it considers to be uh, technical and esoteric issues concerning the internet and openness and um, piracy and um, and all of the, the things that we hold near and dear inside of the internet stakeholder community. Now that presents a real challenge because it means that for those who do understand the importance and nexus of these issues to national development and to social empowerment and to economic advance, they don't always have the, the kind of outlet that will allow these messages to have broad or wide appeal. And, and I want us to, to understand the, the importance of that because it's something that other societies might take for granted. You put a blog out, people read it. You, you, you can get a column in the New York Times or in the Washington Post and it's read by millions. Uh, in the region, even though the societies are small and even though mobile penetration rates are largely over 90 and 95 and in some cases 100 percent, getting a message out is not as easy as it ought to be. And so it means that when you look at some of the critical issues of how the Internet and Internet access and Internet technologies are impacting society in a real way, ranging from um, abuse of, of, of online sites, pornography targeting school children and youth, um, very real privacy issues in terms of how information is captured and shared. Uh, the connection between the, the growth of ICT in small societies and its potential negative and positive impact on society is not being widely ventilated or debated. And of course that has a, a, a very real um, blowback on how policies are then evolved and the, the pace with which investment is made in um, protecting and, and um, securing society in the face of mounting and increasing um, digitization of content. Secondly, the issue of overcoming environmental resistance is something that we've had to confront. Uh, and this is, this is tied to, when I say over environmental resistance, I'm referring to uh, the institutions, both in the public sector but also in the private sector, that have a role and a responsibility to ensure wider and greater access to the internet, um, but who have, of course, a vested economic interest in maintaining the status quo. Uh, that is something that we've had to confront, and confronting it has been made doubly difficult by the fact that so few people have an understanding of the connection between the two. The role of private sector in ruling out infrastructure and, the, and the, the impact that that has for empowering entrepreneurs and creating new classes, new economic opportunities for people who uh, may not have a natural um, uh, direction in, in terms of traditional economic activity. Uh, these things need to have an aware private sector, but they also need to have aware regulators and policymakers to ensure that uh, the, the kind of approaches and the kind of, of incentives are in place to facilitate growth and development of the internet. Uh, thirdly, if I can get this back. Thirdly, we have the um, we have the, the issue of infrastructure. For a lot of the, the countries in the region, uh, critical internet infrastructure uh, does not exist. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later, if we have the time, about what we're doing in terms of internet exchange points, um, DNSSEC, proliferating root servers in the region. All of this is part of the move toward what we call domesticating critical internet infrastructure, bringing it home. And this is a precursor to developing local content. Uh, the interesting thing about the Caribbean region is that there is a lot of digital content being um, created without too much incentive or without too much direct uh, encouragement by the youth in particular, but this is being hosted on foreign sites. Uh, you find a lot of interesting Caribbean material on YouTube and Facebook. And I'm sure this is the same in, in other um, developing markets as well too. And what we, what we are, are trying to do in terms of bringing that content closer to home is making sure that we have the right infrastructure in place 
in terms of uh, local traffic exchange, establishing and proliferating internet exchange points, um, domain name server root resolution, um, in terms of insulating the, the, the countries against uh, cable cuts or, or any kind of break in, in connectivity. And of course, making greater use of CTTLEs, uh, having more people move to their local uh, T, um, TLE top level domain as opposed to just .com .org .net. Uh, the other, the other thing I wanted to to point out is the whole issue of overcoming disconnect. The region is geographically relatively small, but you do have a huge divide between territories, and um, one of the, the issues in terms of creating a regional sense of of internet governance issues is to create to to bridge that divide, and to allow for new levels of national, regional, and international. Uh, connectivity and collaboration, uh, creating fora that actually allow for regional stakeholders to see each other and to hear each other and to also see and understand what's going on at the international level. And those are some of the things that are, are coming under the banner of the Caribbean ICT Roadshow. So if I can sum it up uh, into four areas. One, we're focusing on education and awareness. Uh, the Caribbean ICT Roadshow is one thing. There are also a number of, an increasing number of national initiatives to bring stakeholders together. We're focusing, secondly, on collaboration and capacity building. Uh, groups like the Caribbean Network Operators Group, Caribnog, have been uh, moving throughout the region to try and create a sense of communities of interest, technical communities. Uh, you also have the proliferation of, of Internet Society chapters, which is another very positive development. And that brings stakeholders together to look at some of the softer issues concerning how the Internet is impacting society. Uh, on the cybersecurity front, a number of countries are looking at um, developing suits, and there is a debate still, still going on concerning if we should be moving toward regional suits to also deal with the, the fact that uh, cybersecurity is no respect of borders. Uh, policy frameworks would be the third area that emphasis is being placed on, and there are efforts to harmonize uh, the, the, the legislation as it relates to creating incentives and, and encouraging um, better ICT within the region and lastly infrastructure strengthening would be the fourth initiative being done uh, in the region. With that I will hand you back to the chair. Thank you very much Gapil. What a, an interesting and quite um, enlightening uh, discussion on the Caribbean. Now what we want to do here is um, we'll have a discussion on this particular topic that Bevel brought up subsequently, but I do want to return to, to Maureen, who intended to start the, the agenda. Um, Maureen, can you hear me? Maureen? I have to mute you. Wait Maureen, are you, are you there? Here, All right. Can you just pump your volume up a little, a little louder? And I'm going to hand over to you now. Uh, everyone's listening on headphones. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Maureen. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a, um, a, a microphone thing that keeps wanting to go go lower. Um, but anyway, getting back to getting back to the presentation, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of um, of the Pacific and the um, the Internet Society chapter, which we um, are members of. And um, just to show you that the spread of um, the spread of the of our small islands within the South Pacific Ocean, and um, the populations raise, um, range from um, a couple of hundred to nearly seven million seven million people. Um, and if I draw your attention to um, Papua New Guinea on the left hand side of this of, of this screen. Um, I mean, it's a massive, um, it's a massive piece of land. But what is not so obvious is that there are also 600 small islands, many of which are inha inhabited, and for its over seven million people, they speak 800 different languages. So this is in, is in itself a major issue that is shared, although on a lesser scale, by other Pacific nations with regards to access. Um, cultural issues and of course cost.
In this particular slide, though, I'm showing you my universe, the Cook Islands. And in, in um, our group, there are 15, 15 islands, and I live in the, um, down the bottom in Rarotonga. Um, and that's where the, all the technology development happens in our country. And sometimes to the detriment of other Cook Island communities in the outer islands, which are separated by large um, expanses of water within our economic zone of 2 million square kilometres of ocean. So we, um, we sort of like, in our, in our country, we almost have, have got a digital divide, a digital divide even within our country. Um, and I think that this is um, just to show um, the, the, um, the southern group and the northern group. The southern group gets all the um, access um, because it's, uh, you know, we've, because this is where everything happens, and the northern group um, misses out quite a lot. The only good thing about it is that mobile coverage. There is mobile coverage over the whole country, um, except for Penryn right at the very top, but they're working on that one. Um, this is just to give you a guide of, of um, some price comparisons of the cost of internet in, uh, within the Pacific. Um, on the left hand side in 2009 it shows that with dial up um, Cook Islands was sort of like pretty high in the cost of dial up um, and today we're paying about the same amount for our broadband um, so although the cost uh, the costs are the same uh, we're actually getting much better quality um, uh, speed and access. But one of the things that um, I note is that those countries that actually had would have had cheaper um, internet for dial-up have now got very expensive um, internet, probably because it's speedier and people are using it using it more. Um, our internet is not that hot. Um, our broadband is not that got that hot. But we've got we're um, getting O3B next year, so hopefully that will make a difference. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you a bit to our, um, our very first um, Pacific IGF, which we held um, in New Caledonia um, in April last year. And um, it took place in, um, in the weekend between two important meetings, which were being held at the same time. And one was a meeting of the Pacific Forum government ministers, of transport, energy, and I ICT, and the other was the Pacific Islands Telecommunication Association conference for the telecom geeks. Uh, we were therefore able to have representatives from both of these gatherings attend our first IGF and to be involved in a multi-stakeholder um, dialogue with other communities of um, about of, of internet users. And it was a new experience to be able to engage, and I think this is, was mentioned by the previous speaker, that you know, to be able to engage in a participative approach to discussing important internet-related internet issues of concern to the Pacific. And a formal report on the Pacific um, IGF highlighted some key um, issues, which included access, public policy development, and critical internet resources as the main um, issues. With regards to access, the Pacific is a huge region with a very small and a very spread out population base, as you've seen. Therefore, it's an enormous challenge for us to introduce universal access to high-speed internet services to all the countries in our region. And at the same time, we want to be inclusive and collaborative in our approach to access, which is why we really, we really think the multi-stakeholder approach is very important to us. With relation to um, public policy, one of the issues that came out of our discussion was that although development must allow people across the region to improve their lives and to build their economy, you know, we're dealing with 22 countries and each is quite diverse in their uniqueness, but so that it must be in ways that are consistent with individual cultures and local values. So the challenges are not just geographic, and any development of policy frameworks that we bring to the region must recognize 
and incorporate the important values of our Pacific Island community. With regards to, um, with regards to um, critical infrastructure and resources, um, the Pacific um, IGF report reflected on other issues like the, um, oh, the roles of various stakeholders in managing critical internet resources and the importance of consumer perspectives and their input to key discussions. There was recognition that gov governments are not the only stakeholders and that the multi-stakeholder approach is, vital, is a vital resource in dealing with complicated interactions and allowing all parties to have their say. Um, there were concerns raised about the whole transition to IPv6 and how they were going to impact on how that was going to impact on the Pacific, and as well as concerns about regulatory and security issues that were that was mentioned by the previous speaker and keeping users safe and the infrastructure robust. Um, and just to finish off, um, some of one of the um, there were some local issues that emerged out of our IGF, and these included um, citizen journalism or blogging. And you know, with the greater availability of internet access, people are now able to record and share what is happening in their societies. And and then and with such diversity, this is this is you know, makes 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 it more user friendly for people in the Pacific. And and it's it's in and it's all independent of traditional media outlets. Um, secondly, a digital observatory concept was outlined by a um, New Caledonian unit, which is collating statistics about the use and impact of the internet in the Pacific. And it demonstrated how the data could um, contribute to economic and social development in our region with rela in relation to internet um, technology. The e-waste discussion, which I had a part in, highlighted the um, deficiencies of regional policies relating to e-waste, and it showed how expensive it is to dispose of potentially toxic waste from an island nation, and that there is a need to stem the flow of obsolete technology into the Pacific. That is a real problem. That is a real problem for us. People think they're doing us a favour by giving us their cards off. This doesn't work. But finally, there was a reiteration of the need to ensure that the internet is accessible to all in the Pacific, so that it needs to be in all Pacific languages, and to demonstrate and to ensure that individual cultures, traditions and values are maintained and preserved during the transition to the new technology for our Pacific community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Maureen. Um, again, another very interesting and quite um, enlightening perspective on the Pacific Islands. Um, to complete the, the island perspective, I would like to, to call upon Dukes from Mauritius. I'm hopeful that Dukes is online still. Dukes, can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. So, um, Dukes is from Afrinec. Duke, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Okay, and good morning everybody. My name is Dux and I'm from Mauritius and I work as uh, a webmaster at Afrinic, which is a regional internet registry for the African region. And today, while my uh, talking will not really be focusing on all the islands in the Indian Ocean, I'll be focusing more on what uh, Mauritius is doing in terms of ICT development and how uh, those developments of um, having connections with uh, internet governance issues in the region and but more specifically for Mauritius. So uh, sharing some or as many of the characteristic, um, hello, do you hear me? Yes, you go ahead. Okay, yeah, so as I was saying, mm. are you still with us, Duke? Hello? Duke's continue, go ahead. Yes, so as I was saying, uh, Mauritius is a small island having uh, 2,000 kilometers square of uh, land area with a population of 
approximately 1.3 million and having a composed uh, community belonging originally from the African, Asian and European regions. So we and we have no exploitable natural resources as mineral precious stones and gas and all that. So we depend heavily on the limited uh, amount of land space and human resources that we have. So the way we have moved to uh, ICT development has not really been an easy process because uh, while the authorities have tried to set up the legal framework to enable a proper uh, flourishment of the ICT sector in, in the island, we now have or uh, we have rather reached a certain level of maturity which brings some new issues and Dux, you still there? Hello? Yes, Dux, yes. proceed, continue. So, I, I, I was talking in terms of access and diversity, uh, what Mauritius is doing in terms of access and diversity. So, ITU has classified Mauritius as the 89th global economy for providing access and making heavy use of ICT. But also in terms of developing the required ICT skills through capacity building programs. And if we try to break down these figures, so in simple math per population head, Mauritius is positioned 74 in the ICT development index globally. Within the African region, we are number two, despite the limitations of being a small island. But, and also Mauritius in the top 15 countries where the cost of mobile services, broadband connectivity and ICT is the most affordable. While we have special laws to ensure a maximum of proper internet or as ICT development and governance item, one of the remaining concerns is still the lack of online presence of the various actors contributing in the economical and cultural development such as uh, the small and medium enterprises or women entrepreneurs and their corresponding e-commerce presentations. The various artists and their creativity is also or simply uh, the local e-commerce versus already established uh, e-commerce uh, companies such as Amazon or eBay. So in terms of diversity, as Mauritius is a multicultural country relying officially on English and French as communication language, we have the advantage of other representatives from regions such as India and the Arabic regions through funding um, anti-lingualism representation. So we don't have to work hard then and not. And create on so wonderful things are talked specifically. The most common emerging issues in Mauritius are not was are not as different as they are in the in in in, uh, in comparison to the other developed countries. And these issues are kind of related to the global positioning numbers I mentioned already, uh, such as limited representation of the SMEs, women entrepreneurs, and other stakeholders, mainly uh, due to lack of awareness and limited capacity building, and also missing incentives such as profit margin through local e-commerce activities. We have an increasing concern of privacy, online security, and fraud such as online scamming, phishing, and credit card because mm, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, merchants now which are doing a uh, major part of uh, uh, some, some major activities online such as paying tax to the government or you know, the internet banking services. So, so uh, when we are moving more online, we are also facing uh, the same difficulties being faced in other regions. Uh, 
uh, just like I just mentioned. So, and including uh, the ice deleted framework itself, which in comparison to other uh, small uh, island states, is uh, well, I I don't know if it's much better or not, but it's helping our economy to move. But to a certain extent, it's also not evolving to the required speed because uh, with uh, ICT, with the number of ICT developments happening in the region, uh, the legal framework is not as flexible as it should be. So, with these emerging issues, we also have opportunities, which we, uh, well, the authorities are trying to uh, to, to 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 handle, uh, such as uh, the current internal governance situation. Uh, we, in, if if uh, we compare the Indian Ocean region, especially the island, uh, small state islands, there has been no uh, dedicated internet governance discussions on how to 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 bridge uh, uh, in terms of the various islands Duxa, are you are you finished? Uh, sorry, I was still continuing uh, about uh, the opportunities present. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, and um, but you you have about um, five minutes. Thank you. Duxa, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. All right, so you have five minutes to wrap up. Uh, okay. Well, as I was uh, moving to the next phase of the critical uh, ice infrastructure in the region, especially for Mauritius, while we are connected to uh, the satellite cable which connects us with uh, the European port and port, we, uh, we still we do not really host us and cautious. So just in case if something happens, just like the uh, lost tsunami which happened in the Indian Ocean region, we sometimes face situations where uh, the characteristic shared by the small island uh, puts us in a a bit of complicated situation where we are con disconnected from the rest of the world. So these are opportunities which we have to tackle in terms of critical infra uh, internet infrastructure. And, but also related to this, or uh, the, uh, the overall internet governance issue, which we kind of are not really tackling directly I think we may have lost you again. Are you there? Dukes? Uh, yes. Uh, we lost you at the end and you, you have like um, one minute to wrap up. Dukes, are you hearing me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yes, can you wrap up and while well, you have one minute to wrap up the discussion from uh, your side? Well, uh, to wrap up quickly, as uh, the other speakers have already mentioned, uh, the difficulties shared uh, that they're having in the Pacific region and the Caribbean region is something that we share here also because uh, we have a diverse uh, uh, a population with diverse cultures, uh, multiple languages, and spread over 
a large uh, geographical area. So uh, I'll wrap up with saying that we are sharing uh, the same issues, the same problems, and kind of the same opportunities uh, with other regions also. All right, thank you very much, Duke. That's also a very um, useful presentation um, from the position of Mauritius, um, grouped in the African region, although based in the Indian Ocean. Um, what I think is important for us to realize is the reason why the, the SIDS are um, grouped together is that they share many, many similarities and commonalities, both in terms of their history, um, their legal infrastructure, um, language, and so on. Um, I'm going to right now pass you over to Mr. Carlton Samuels from UWI Mona, who would provide a summary of what has been um, discussed thus far, and who would also lead us off in discussion. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the, the panelists in the room from the uh, small island developing states as well will jump in and, and add to discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tracy. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, just to uh, give you a little background on the small island development states and uh, the kind of challenges we have. Uh, uh, all the speakers have mentioned that we are, as it were, small rocks in a large ocean. Uh, we have small populations. We have a history, a common history of colonialism. And, and, and exploitation and so on. Uh, we have a common legal framework, mostly based on the common law. Uh, we have uh, challenges with respect to uh, access. Uh, it's very important to us. We have challenges with respect to the cost of access to, to the Internet. And then we have uh, some of the imperatives we share the same imperatives that we we are now looking to the internet as a way to uh, improve our economic situation and to uh, bridge the digital divide uh, get on with the social inclusion and so on and for most of us all of us in fact we we see perhaps the internet as the single most important thing in transforming our education systems and uh, giving us the ability to to participate in the global knowledge economy. So now, what what do we mean with in terms of internet governance? Um, all the speakers have mentioned the fact that uh, for us to fully participate and to uh, organize ourselves, we 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 are too few of us. So they really understand. And so the, the greatest challenge for those of us who know a little bit about this is building capacity both nationally, regionally, and internationally. Um, Beville mentioned this, and he talks about some of the initiatives that has been going on in the Caribbean in terms of helping to develop capacity. We are uh, collaborating across territories, in defining the issues, in ensuring that uh, the issues are propagated using the best resources. He tells you the challenge we have in uh, the terms of the media and the lack of knowledge of the I Internet and, and all these things. Governments in all the regions seem to be uh, fixed on the access issue uh, uh, mostly. <clears throat> and um, they because they're top of mind, they tend to get more play in the media. Things like how do we ensure that more people have access to the Internet? So, for example, in all the regions, you hear a lot about going on about development of community access points for the Internet. You hear a lot about harmonization of uh, the regulatory frameworks. Um, most of us come from areas where we are in liberalization of the telecommunications regime. So we are transitioning to uh, active market situations. 
and that has its implications for all of us. Uh, the slew of laws that will enable us to participate fully and to exploit the resources uh, have to be in place. Uh, just about everywhere, all of the regions, you have a whole slew of new laws coming into play. Telecommunications Act, New Communications Act, Data Protection, Electronic Transaction Laws, uh, Privacy Laws even. Um, and all these are, are enablers for the information society that we, we are all trying to enable on our way to participation in the global economy. So, w I would prefer to look at the opportunities for us. We, we are all agreed that uh, the internet presents perhaps the last best thing for small island development states to improve our economic situation and to get on with the business of social inclusion, to bring in, bring in groups that are historically outside the mainstream into the, 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 the light of economic situations. Uh, the major challenge for us is improving the education content for our citizens. And this does not, it's a soft issue, that's true, but what is required is for us to totally reimagine our education systems. And this is where the internet becomes uh, central to the idea of improvement. Um, the, the, the fact is that as you look at developing the education systems and curriculum, then the collaboration that is required to make that, and talking about regional collaboration, national collaboration, is very critical. More connectivity, each of us connected to all of us, is critical for effective outcomes in this case. And so the, the opportunity that the internet provides us is the ability for each of us to connect to all of us. And then once we're connected, we begin to share. That is critical to development. The, the, one of the disabilities that we have right now is the question of measurement. The fact is we don't do very well in measuring what happens. And there is a saying, if you've been in, in, in one of the things I took away from graduate school business, is that what gets managed, what gets measured, gets managed. And this is where Mauritius comes in. M Mauritius, of all of the small island developing states, probably has the best um, set of indicators, ICT indicators, dis defined. And uh, this is where I think there could be effective collaboration across the regions in looking at the measurements indicators for ICT and for internet uh, usage and access. Because it provides us with a baseline to interact, to act on what we perceive is lacking and what we might do better in terms of eliciting the kinds of outcomes we want. So that disability is connected to the opportunity for us to collaborate. Some of us are farther ahead than others of us, and this is a way for us to build capacity and share, hopefully, in the prosperity that we are all seeking. The, the other issue that is um, quite important, and which doesn't get a lot of uh, attention right now, are, are the softer issues, and, and the, these take up a lot of time in the IGF, but they, they don't get uh, discussed as much as they ought to in our regions. 
And I'm talking about things like privacy, online security, cyber security, uh, think about fraud, and, and, and those kinds of issues. Um, they, they, they are going to be very important for us to begin to consider seriously. And here again, this is a real opportunity for those of us in the small island developing states to get together and see what we can do together to make this uh, more more effective for, for all of us. Because we, we have different priorities, that's true. But when you look at the impact that these soft issues could have on the objectives that we seek, it seems to me that they present a real opportunity for us to begin to collaborate more in, in developing a framework that is appropriate for our situation. The, 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 the issue of content is an, 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 an content uh, in, in the context of the cultural affinities that we have. Uh, you hear our friends from the Pacific with 800 uh, different languages to, to have to accommodate in, in, in their framework. Uh, clearly for us in the Caribbean, if we, if we talk about just the, the, the four major language groups that we, we are connected to, I mean, in comparison to our friends in the, in the Pacific, that's a, that's, that challenge is, 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 is like, you know, from a gnat to an elephant. But, um, so here again, the imperative for the, for the Pacific in terms of uh, the culture and dealing with the language issue, uh, this certainly is, is, is probably more intense for them, but I see an opportunity uh, for us to collaborate and look at local content and how that will impact the culture and the cultural affinities that we seek to, to, to promote. Uh, the, 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 here, here's, here's something that we need to to look at again. Mobile penetration rates are very high, but broadband penetration rates are very low. And the content development and things related to using content would be best promoted if our broadband penetration rates increases across the board and so the question is what might we do in terms of development initiatives to uh, promote to potentiate improvements in broadband penetration rates in the regions it is true that there is there are some initiatives that might be developed around the regulatory paradigm, um, uh, in, in, and there are a couple of good examples where the regulatory framework is being used to uh, to, to promote broadband penetration in the in, in the marketplace. Uh, they, they're, they're, there are some other interesting initiatives that are being developed elsewhere where content, it's, it's almost a kind of a push-pull situation where there are deliberate attempts to develop content, local content, and, and, and developing uh, mobile applications. The idea is that if you have more local content, you have local applications, that will probably drive demand for broadband. And when you have a, a, a complementary initiative from, uh, from, from the operators and from the regulators in terms of making the price points attractive for people to access uh, broadband uh, services, uh, then, then you could get to a, a very happy medium where uh, 
developing content, local content, developing local application, creating communities of practice that Bevel spoke about in his presentation is one good way for us to enable broadband penetration locally. Um, this is an area, as I say, for, uh, for us to exchange ideas about how we might approach uh, initiatives that could inure to the benefit of all of us in terms of broadband penetration. Uh, finally, the, the, the history of governance. Yesterday, in a very interesting session, uh, a, a speaker said, well, the internet is free and it it's, seems like an oxymoron to be talking about governance in something that we wish to be free. And I thought about it for a minute and uh, it, it was interesting um, and I thought, wh where do we go from here? Here is what I think is in our interest. For small island development states, that the internet is positioned as a vehicle for economic empowerment, social inclusion, and so on. The principle of openness must be adopted. I believe with openness comes greater opportunities for each of us to connect to all of us for each of us to participate as best as we can, for each of us to contribute that which we have for the benefit of all of us. So that's a major principle. Does that principle on that basis, that is my bottom line principle, does it then require a framework for governance? I would argue yes. Because even as we position the internet as common, then there has to be some rules for the road. And when we start begin to look, think about what the rules might be, then we run into a whole gaggle of rights that are chafing against each other. <clears throat> there are rights to privacy freedom of expression, rights to be left alone, for example. Um, there's rights to information. And the question for us becomes, how do we navigate between the imperatives of all of these rights so that we have a common infrastructure, a common set of guidelines, a common set of behaviors that enable an internet that becomes useful to us to mitigate the history of social exclusion, to improve our economic situation and put us on the bright path to further development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlton, and that plug for Bright Path at the same time. Um, so we've had some interesting perspectives coming from all of the, the groupings of the small island developing states. Um, we've also had a, a summary and, and I guess discussion type intervention from Carlton. What I'd like to do now is open up the floor to responses from um, some of our colleagues from the region who might be here first of all. Um, and then thereafter, if there's anyone else who would like to, to jump in um, who is not from a small and developing state, please feel free. So first, let me see if there's anybody from a SIDS who would like to intervene and have a, a, a say at this point in time. There's several of us in the room. Yes. Um, do we hear, is the mic on the floor? The mic? A mic? Microphone.
Uh, Talofa Lava, Marianne Franklin, born in Samoa, raised in New Zealand, so relatively small island developing state. Yeah, kia ora. <laughs> <laughs> um, but re resident now in the former colonial empire called England. Um, my question is to all the presenters, particularly from the Cook Islands and Fiji, which I missed, but um, I'll get up to date on that. I hear what you're saying. My feeling, though, in this panel is that it's as if the Internet has only just arrived in the Pacific. It has been there since the mid-1990s. Patchy, uneven, based on dial-up, expensive. The Pacific Island communities in the Pacific and through their links with their diasporic communities around the world have been very, very active in a very early form of social media called bulletin board um, discussion forums. So I'd like to remind the panel and ask particularly my Cook Islands and um, Fijian friends how they see what they're talking about now in relation to this long, rich history. It is not just the sea of rocks. As Epili Haofa says, it's a sea of islands. Okay, so it's a different way of looking at it. I'm just interested in what your perspective is on the historical development previous to 2012. Maybe I can jump in there. All right, just, just hang on one sec, Carlton. Um, is there anyone else from the floor who would want to intervene um, quickly? Trevor? All right. Put the mic on. Sit on the mic. Trevor Phipps from St. Kitts. The concern I have is regards to data protection and privacy issues. I think it's an area that we are, well, from a St. Kitts perspective, we are overlooking or not addressing it as rapidly as we need to, given the fact that you have movements through the OECD, the EU Data Protection and Privacy Act, that will impact how we do business and may force us to change faster than we want to. Thank you, Trevor. Um, anybody, Krishna? Identify yourself and... Um Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, actually, I would like to add something. When uh, my good friend from Mauritius was actually talking about uh, some of the things that are really happening, uh, probably he might have missed up on the real uh, major ha uh, things that had happened over the last few months. Uh, we've actually opened up the... We have the reg well, a policy on open Internet access in Mauritius. Uh, uh, I, my, my good friend there was talking about broadband. We've a, we are actually moving a bit away from the cable, the usual copper cable. We are moving towards more like uh, uh, WiMAX and 4G so that you know people can really have access all over the place. Um, in terms of uh, security and all that stuff, we've got a lot of policies on, on, on that. My good friend was talking about data protection. Uh, our Data Protection Act was enabled uh, in 2008. It was there in 2004. But was actually, uh, you know, promulgated uh, quite in 2008. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot of things really happening, and I I'm wondering whether um, it would be. Well, as you mentioned, it's it's a good uh, thing to actually discuss these points. Uh, but um, I, I mean, from from my own perspective and being part of Mauritius itself, I would say we've actually moved uh, quite. Uh, fast in, in that lane and I would say that um, it's been quite interesting and I take the the note from the built-in board service we actually started in 99 really having a good internet in Mauritius and then it's actually moved pretty fast but obviously uh, cost is still a problem uh, in terms of uh, when we uh, use the internet but uh, the government has actually put in a lot of policies right now which is trying to enable people of um, who cannot really afford uh, high bandwidth to actually be connected on a, on, a, on a reasonable ground. And uh, the figures are quite interesting. And we're actually moving towards that direction. So it's quite a lot of things really happening. Um, I mean, if you need more information, I think you can actually hit on our regulator's side, which is ICTA.mu. You would see that uh, our report is actually there. And you would see how, how much uh, things are actually moving at our place. I mean, with the recent uh, open internet access policy, you can there's a lot of operators just actually dropping in. So really, it's, it's happening. And as of next year, we, we, we are really sitting down and looking at how to really, whether we want to control it or whether we want to regulate it. Uh, well, I will, I, I'm the one who's going to be actually looking at it, that, but uh, it's, it's happening. So really, we could actually show a lot. Maybe, Chris, you could just, um, just say what your role is in Mauritius, perhaps, so you could... Pardon me? What is your, your upcoming role in Mauritius? 
just just for the record uh well um as of next well actually right now i'm still on the board of the national regulator so i'm a board member of the icta well, icta which is the regulator as of next year i will be the uh, advisor to the prime minister for the internet national internet policy so that's why i've actually wanted to add uh, these points thank you um so before i move back to carlton and bevel is there anybody else from the floor all right so i so i see um anil and my colleague from jamaica just just hand him the mic first yeah jamaica Hi everyone. My name is Dana Raj Thakur. I'm from Jamaica. So when it, when we talk about SIDS, one of is regional action. You know, um, different regional organizations working in this in this space and in the Caribbean. I feel like there are multiple organizations that overlap with each other when we talk about internet governance, ICTs in general. Um, there's some called the regional development, digital development strategy. That the Caribbean community had put out. There's some called the Caribbean Internet Governance Policy Framework, which the Caribbean Internet Governance Forum has also put out. There's some overlap between them. So my question then is, how do we sort out these um, overlaps, given our tendency to act regionally, which is important. But how do we sort out that kind of overlap? Yes, yeah, so Anna, use the mic. Um, I just want to point out that, um, oh, I have Anil Ramnanan from the University of the West Indies. Uh, one of the important things you should, I think, is making the internet access available to the, the low-income uh, communities because right now it is kind of expensive, and um, but there are opportunities there to, to leverage the internet for um, you know improving um, the, the the lives of people in low income communities, one of the projects that I was working on with um, the university uh, a project held by Dr. Kim Malu called M Fisheries was the development of a mobile application for fishermen uh, in order to for them to connect with each other to connect with the coast guard to connect with people who we willing to, to buy from them and uh, it was uh, the pilot project had very positive responses uh, if the internet access is available to them there are opportunities for these types of applications to 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 be able to be developed and yeah and in, in improve the lives of, of, of the people thank you Okay, we've lost internet access everywhere. Okay, we're frozen, in, as you can see on that screen, we're frozen in time. Um, but nonetheless, um, for the participants in the room, um, I will put you onto Carlton to respond to the plethora of um, statements we've had, and then onto Bevel, and we'll open up the floor subsequent to that to see if there's any further interventions. Okay, thank you. Um, Tracy, um, the first uh, is straight. Um, it is true that um, internet has been around for quite some time. Um, what we are talking about here is democratization of it. For example, University of West Indies, we had a 9.6 dial-up line to Puerto Rico. Uh, That's the first time we had internet access in uh, the Caribbean, in the English-speaking Caribbean. 9.6 line, dial-up and you, you dial up three or four times a day to download email. And we, after that came a rich set of bulletin boards managed by several people all over, including people from, people from the university here. So we were the, the pioneers in Internet access, but then it was very slow. Well, so what we are talking about here now is democratization. There were some of us who, they, what they call the, 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 the people who would know, who are in the know, and have access to it, who got it from the ISPs. And the ISPs, you were talking about the 9.6 line, that dial-up was about, about 120 U.S. dollars a month. 
now I can get a hundred megabits of 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 wired access, one hundred megabit of wired access in my house for about eighty US dollars a month. Um, this is in Jamaica, so there there is two things that's happening. One, oh, the other thing was that the devices that you had to use to access the internet in the early days it was laptops PCs and these things cost an arm and a leg very few people had them with democratization there are a couple of things that are happening and they're all happening at the same time one the cost of internet is going down but it's not going down at the speed at which it ought to to have more people participate True, you have a plethora of device types that are now available for accessing. The big one, which we talk, hear about here, is a mobile device. And the question becomes, how do you organize yourself so that people with mobile devices can access the Internet? We are making the case that if you give them something to do, to use it for, is a good push-pull way of getting them to use the internet. The M Fisheries project by my colleague Kim Malalu out of the UWR at St. Augustine is one that uh, I would recommend. It's actually in use now in the Cook Islands. And this is, this is one uh, example of collaboration between small island developing states. It was developed in Trinidad and Tobago, which is in the Caribbean. It's now exported and used in the Cook Islands, way in the Pacific. So we have that history, and, and we know it. The other development is, of course, making the Internet accessible to people who were historically excluded. Those are rural people, small people who don't have, have low incomes and all that. And this is uh, several initiatives around there, the principal one being these community access points. Not all of us are happy with what they do with community access points because for the most part community access points now are enabled by wired connectivity. We want to move to more wireless connectivity and this is where broadband penetration wirelessly is important to us because those of who understand the technology, one wired connection in in, in an area can become a hub for lots of others in that same area. And, and, and each one can teach one. And so we can improve the penetration rates, we can improve the access rates by the broadband wireless technology penetration. So that's important to us. The history of the laws, you're quite right. Um, as, as some of us recognize, that the enabling infrastructure for using internet for economic and social inclusions requires some work. There is a legal framework and we spoke about some of them. Data protection is a major one. You're quite right because of some of the, uh, uh, let us say, bilateral requirements with the European Union, for example, under the Economic Partnership Agreement requires a lot of, uh, well, let, let us say that they, you will be forced to make some concessions to European law. And, and that chafes some of us, but that's the way the, way the world is. Now, it is true that we have some laws that are, for example, in St. Lucia. St. Lucia probably had a data protection law long before 2008. Here's the problem. It's not enabled yet. Perfectly good data protection law. If you look at it, it's well written. It, it addresses all of the issues, but it's not in force today. So we need to turn that on. They have to be given a reason to turn it on because there's an enabling environment that has to be in place to make that work. The open internet access, our colleague from Mauritius, that is a big thing for us to support. You would imagine that, uh, I, I tell you that in, in our business, we are for openness because we believe that is the easiest and most effective way to build capacity and in to, to improve the educational content that we so desperately need to move up the scale in the global knowledge economy. So it's very important 
that you understand that we support openness. We also make it very clear that we are at different places. And I mention Mauritius specifically because I have been trolling the Mauritius site. And I have some friends, Dave Kissendial, who comes from Mauritius, who I've been communicating with. Uh, he's helped me a lot to find out what's happening there. And we are very much uh, conscious that some of us are ahead of others. That is why we are saying openly, over and over again, there is space for collaboration. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We want to be able to move and move much faster. And we feel that if we can shamelessly copy, <laughs> we call it capacity building otherwise, <laughs> what is happening in, with our friends and brothers in the rest of the small island developing states, of course we'll do it. Let me just um, ask Bevel to step in yeah. and to take some of the um, questions that came up before. Okay, and I wanted to just continue on that same note in terms of collaboration um, to respond to the, the question from Jamaica concerning uh, multiple initiatives. And I, I don't think this is a Caribbean phenomenon. I think this is, is occurring in all of the, the, the jurisdictions where you have a number of groups, very um, genuinely interested groups, trying to do their own thing um, and sometimes out of sight of other groups that are intending to do the exact same thing. Uh, what we have found... At, as a, um, a very practical mechanism for dealing with that is actually it's very simple relationships 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 um, a lot of those uh, those what might seemingly be large groups and independent bodies working in parallel tracks are actually people who because they don't know each other and can't uh, what I call can't see each other um, they, they proceed along a certain path without consideration for uh, duplication of, of effort and energy a big part of what, what happens and what should happen is um, the whole issue of sharing. In the case of the Caribbean, I can say that um, in terms of persons like Carlton and myself who work on different bodies, we do ensure that what happens in one place gets ported to another. Mm -hmm. And that's also happening between regions. I'm now, for example, taking a very successful mobile application workshop that we've developed in the Caribbean that goes beyond mobile apps. It goes into how do apps and the app development community interface with the ISP community and mobile operators mm -hmm. and we're taking that entire program and carrying it across to the Pacific Islands and that will actually be run in um, late November and people are coming in from I think it's Cook Islands, Vanuatu, Tuvalu uh, into Fiji for that event and we plan to do several similar exchange type events where lessons learned, practices and experiences gained uh, can be shared across regions. A similar thing is also being done with the proliferation of internet exchange points. A big part of why there has been um, less than optimal momentum behind internet exchange point proliferation is because the argument has for too long been a technical discussion. and So it has been left to the technical community, normally a subset of that community within the operator space to debate whether or not this should or shouldn't happen. What we have done in the Caribbean is we've made it a social and economic development concern and therefore widened the debate um, beyond just the operators and self-interested groups and made it now a matter of national development, public policy, um, political priority to allow that conversation to accelerate now to the point where we actually have over the last two years three internet exchange points and another three on stream for the next uh, three to four months. That's major progress in a very short space of time simply by, again, leveraging the issue of collaboration and relationship and working across, um, working to break artificial boundaries that have limited the kinds of conversations that were taking place over critical internet issues. And I think that's an important uh, thing for us to take into all of the, the small islands is the issue of relationships and developing and nurturing um, beneficial collaborative partnerships to allow for a new momentum to uh, attend IG development. All right, thank you very much, Bevel. Um, we are coming very rapidly to the end of the, the time for the session. Um, are there any further interventions from the audience? Yes? You hear me? Yes. Yeah, hello. I'm, I'm in, I'm based in Fiji and I'm working for, I used to work for SPC and no, working now for JZ, the German funds, for 
and uh, for six months ago, um, um, I was uh, I was missioned for developing a climate change portal for three countries, for Fiji, Tonga, and Vanuatu. So I visited all the three islands. I have experience in New Caledonia and stuff. And um, just for responding for your capacity for internet, when I was in Tonga and Vanuatu, was, they are almost not connected for the moment. Uh, in Tonga, I had to deliver a server, for example, and um, yeah, they're going to be connected to submarine cable, I think, uh, in, a, in the next year, Vanuatu also. But all initiative, even if they are really keen to participate for climate change inf information adaptations, uh, things, they are completely convinced about this because they are concretely facing the problem. <coughs> um, the implementation is very difficult because of the internet connectivity. Fiji, of course, is uh, out of range of all these islands because they have they are really well connected now, and um, the capacity is really there. But uh, I must say, for the next islands, I have to treat for Tuvalu, Nauru, and all the other lines. It's it's a main problem. Kiribati, for example, is just impossible to implement this kind of project. We have to find other solutions, wireless stuff, or duplication with servers, even sending s s concrete cities for updating database and uh, this kind of solution. So the 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 main the two main problems we are facing in Pacific is of course the distance between the islands, who are much broader than the, I think in Caribbean yeah. when you see uh, Kiribati and all these islands, and uh, they're facing also concrete climate change problems. Um, it's supposed to be solved with this technology and all the sharing system, but uh, even the government in itself they are conscious about this. They're keen to make something. But there are no real strategy, even, even policy, about all this sharing information problems. For example, Tonga, again, is, um, is really reluctant in the first moment. You really have to make uh, a work of diplomacy and uh, to, to explain them the benefits of sharing, uh, especially in climate, climate change, to, uh, to make things happen. There was a, I think there's a lot of, lot of work to do in all directions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Again, what's happening in, in your in your region? Well, what I heard there, of course, there there's a lot a lot of, a lot to learn. Thank you. Now, I believe Maureen um, was online. Maureen, can you hear me? Maureen. Uh, yes. Um, yes. So Maureen wanted to intervene. Go ahead, Maureen. Go ahead, Maureen. I wanted to um, respond to the lady from Samoa, or now England. Go ahead, Maureen. <laughs> um, yeah, I just sort of, I, I don't, I, I just sent you an email. I didn't know whether you'd actually read it, but um, one of the reasons that you know, like, I mean, that things haven't been happening, and and I mean, I totally agree with the previous speaker about the difficulties, but one of the things that things haven't happened is lack of will by government. I mean, the governments um, in the Pacific are sort of like the the hardest to actually make any real contact with to actually sort of get them to, to buy into the importance of the development of the internet. Um, when you've got, you know, they've got small populations, when they've got small populations, the um, infrastructure and all that sort of stuff is just too much for them. I um, mean, the Cooks, we have 14,000 in the country on a good day. So the, the population doesn't bring any hope of high return when you, you know, with the expense of infrastructure. It, and it doesn't seem worth it for their small minds. Um, also, in the Cooks, we have a monopoly, and that's um, you know it's a, for a, a lot of the other small islands, it's the same sort of thing. Um, and in our country, you know, um, the the telecom has a really tight contract, um, so that you know the government's still like tied um, to to telecom for quite a number of years to come. And um, so, and and really, I mean. I sort of like you have to admire them a bit. This, you know, they are sort of like getting a bit out, but really, it's all down to money. Um, you know, profit, profit. If they're making profit, they'll do it. If they can't make a profit, they won't. Um, and also, when it came back to the um, government, MPs in the past have been older types who weren't interested in, in technology, but they're getting younger, and um, even you know, and some of them even know what you're talking about. So things can only improve, but unfortunately. It's just happening far too slow. Thanks. All right, thanks, Maureen. Um, sorry about that. Um, I believe there's a, a final 
point and our wrap-up point from our rapporteur, uh, designated rapporteur all of a sudden, um, Andrew from Fiji. Um, I echo the same sentiments as brought by, um, as presented by Maureen, um, Min, and other other colleagues of ours. Um, it's quite obvious that there are a lot of issues <laughs> in relation to connectivity and improving um, services. But just touching on his point, um, not all the I mean, not all parts of the countries are um, are not connected to internet. I mean, there are some parts that are connected and they are doing well. But in relation to some of the work we are doing, like climate change, e agriculture, e-agriculture, um, forestry work, and also education, it, this, there's, uh, there's some limitations. And um, we're trying to uh, come together in the, in the Pacific in, in, on the 22nd to 26th November. And Maureen is also a chair of the, of the board. And what we're trying to do is bring in regulators, operators, and everyone, like a multi-stakeholder, to, to not only talk about the issues, because we know that there are issues, but also to try to come up with the solution, the, the real solutions. And I know that it's a challenge for anyone. For example, for my work, it's a challenge, a big challenge to try to implement ICT within the agriculture sector. But I know that end of the day, we have to work with the governments, right? I mean, if we can't work with the governments, then it becomes really difficult for us to implement some of the strategies or some of the policies we have. In relation to policies, there are, it's always on the top level. It does not trickle down to the bottom. And this is one thing that we notice in relation to policies and also strategies. Because um, most of it is just people are just talking about the policies, but in terms of, and then they have activities to be implemented, but there are no funding, there are no resources. And so this is another major issue. And I know that this is probably the same issue for everyone else. But... Um, in relation to what Fiji is doing um, since 1990, and I mean, we've got the broadband policy and we've got the fiber optic cable and the internet connectivity is pretty good in, in the urban areas, but, and the mobile penetration is almost 90% coverage. But again, the rural communities are not uh, benefiting. And we hope that someday we will reach that, <laughs> that uh, level. But what I think, what we need to understand is, how do we tap into the existing resources in IGF? Because we're here, and I come from Fiji, and I think there's another colleague of mine, and not many come from the Pacific, because it takes almost 30 hours, 10, 26 to 30 hours to get here, and more, yeah, and the transit and stuff, so it, it's a while, but what we need to find is just to see where we can tap into existing resources, and if anyone in this room is able to help or to be able to support any initiatives, we are welcome to, to collaborate. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, well, that round of applause, I guess, signals the end of our workshop as well. So I'd like to give us a round of applause as well. Um, just like to let you know that I'm not sure if you're aware that this workshop is a feeder workshop into the main session. So our colleague Andrew has been diligently and quite um, um, kindly taking notes for us, uh, volunteered, she volunteered. <laughs> and if you uh, want to find what's happening, it's in the main session, it uh, starts at three, three, three o'clock in the main room where Andrew will be reporting on this workshop as part of the overall main session. Um, do have a good lunch, um, enjoy the line, and um, we'll see you at another workshop sometime soon where we get all the small island states back together again. Thanks Maureen out there in the Cook Islands. Thanks for coming in. Yes, thank you. Thanks Maureen. Okay. Thanks Dukes for coming in. And uh, all the remote participants who were online or watching on the webcast, thank you very much. And uh, do have the rest of a pleasant, rest of a pleasant day or night wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.